Hello and welcome to the Read to Know podcast, where the goal is to actually remember what you read. On this podcast, we go through a book one chapter at a time, and each week we actually practice remembering what we've read. So we don't just remember, but then we can actually better apply it to our life. If you want to follow along, we're currently working our way through Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This week, we'll be looking at Habit 5, Seek First to Understand, Then to be Understood. Next week, we'll look at Habit 6, which is Synergize. I'm Zach Brown, and my friend Chris Yarber is joining me to help discuss and break down this book. Also, if you've been listening and following along up to this point, we're super stoked that you're here, and we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out and uh, say hello. We are at Read to Know Pod on all platforms. Uh, also, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and a review. It would help us a ton. And uh, if you don't have Apple Podcasts, no worries. Just share this with a friend who might be interested. Anyway, thanks again for listening and enjoy the conversation. Christopher. Yes. That's your full name. It is. You prefer you prefer Chris, right? Yeah. No okay. one calls me Christopher. Only my family does normally. My right. mom would when she was mad at me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, my full name is Zachariah. I obviously prefer Zach. Not many people call me Zachariah though. I think more people call you Christopher yeah. than people call me Zachariah. I have never known you in the couple years that I've known you, I've never heard anybody call you Zachariah. Mostly when people are trying to be dramatic or um or just trying to be funny or something. Right. That's right. when I get called Zachariah. Right. Not when not anyone actually seriously calling me that so right my favorite uh part about your name zach brown mm-hmm. is of course everyone knows the country band zach brown band right. and the fact that on instagram you have in your bio <laughs> not your favorite country band that's awesome yes so yeah. i appreciate that I'm very proud of that i thought that up myself yes and uh yeah well today i also i actually have coffee in this cup yeah. today so this might be the first podcast, second podcast, where I actually have coffee in yeah. this cup. So, not it's water. Not, it's not LaCroix. Yeah. Right. It's not, not LaCroix, LaCroix, not water, not aha. Going straight coffee today. Yep. Thank you, Airbus. I had a cold brew earlier this morning and now second cup today. Man. It's just one of those days. You should Sometimes be ready to go. It. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, we are now on to habit five. Yeah. Five out of seven. We are most of the way done. We are. We're getting close to the end. Yeah. You look at the amount of book we have left and it's really, really small compared to where we started. So it's a good feeling. Yep. We're on habit five, which is then seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's the second habit in the public victories moving from uh, independence to interdependence. And uh, again, a pretty interesting chapter here and very actionable. He said this at some point in the chapter. He said it's like the most actionable thing that most of the time people can take away from from usually what Stephen Covey talks about in his speeches and and when he goes and um, and has you know conferences and things like that, um, it's the most actionable thing you can take out of out of all these habits because you can immediately in your next conversation seek to understand right before seeking to be understood right yeah it is the fastest habit that you can start right away out of all the habits this is the one that uh you can practice the most but you can only practice it as you engage in real conversation Mm -hmm. and so really this habit speaks to the principles of and he talks about this word empathetic communication yeah because communication is really the lifeblood for all relationships and this is what really makes our conversations because he says this later in the chapter as well When we have our win-win conversations with people, Mm -hmm. this is really the first step to the win-win habit that Mm -hmm. we covered in Habit 4, so really important. Exactly, and he starts off this chapter, he starts it off with another story, another illustration, and uh, it's kind of a comical one because because we see the the absurdity in, in this logic. But yet we use the same logic in our communication like every single day. We do. <laughs> and so the, the, the story is, you know, this guy goes to his eye doctor and he's like, I can't see. I'm having trouble with my eyes. And, you know, this, this you know, he explains the problem, does some test and uh, or I'm sorry, he explains the problem. Mm-hmm. And the doctor just says, well, here, use my glasses. These work for me. And he puts them on and he's like, well, I, I can't, I still can't see. Well, try harder. They, they, mm-hmm. they, they work for me. So mm-hmm. just try harder. They'll work. And he's like, no, I still can't see. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's the epitome of, of this. When we try to, when we, when we seek to be understood before we actually understand. Right. He calls it 
he calls it um, giving the prescription before uh, getting the diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really funny how he uses that picture because later on, he uses uh, a, a another illustration with another doctor mm-hmm. when their child, when Stephen Covey and his wife's child is sick. You remember that? And um, he, uh, they call him, and when he gives them a prescription over the phone, he doesn't realize that right. their daughter is two years old right. because he's in a rush, and so he asks them a couple questions, and that's and that's mm-hmm. it. It uh, really reminds us of our communication style. And he, he even goes over uh, and says at the very beginning, you know, we take a lot of time to learn to read and to write, but how much time do we actually focus on listening and learning right. how to listen? And, and the empathetic listening, that's the key to all of this, uh, because he goes through several different listenings close to the beginning where you can, in a conversation, you can just kind of, you know, pretend listen where you're like, yeah. uh-huh, right, mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. You know, and that's pretend listening. Mm -hmm. And then you also have selective listening, which is what my wife would say that I have, where you hear parts of the conversation, but not the whole thing. So there are different types of uh, listening, but we want to get to the empathetic communication and listening to understand people and not just to hear our voice heard and understood. And it's funny that those examples, you know, they seem comical, but how many, we do it all the time. We do it all the time in, in talking and communicating and all that stuff. Someone says, oh, I have a problem with this. And then you're like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what worked for me. That should work for you. you right. know? And that's you immediately go to. And he calls it bringing your autobiographical um, yeah. um, um, your autobiographical story, basically, mm-hmm. to an, and you're trying to apply your own personal experiences to someone else's. And it doesn't work that way. Right. And even if it did work, even if, you know, maybe the solution is what you're saying. They're not going to be receptive to it because you just you just blurted it out. You know, like that's what worked for me, and right. like, no one's no one no one accepts that. And like you know, you can remember that. That when was the last time that you mentioned something and someone said, "I'll tell you what worked for me. You should do this," and you were like, "Yeah, I'm yeah, not going right. to do it." Right. You you might have said, "Yeah, okay," right. but then you immediately turned around and was like, "Nope." Yeah. <laughs> even and if it was going to be the right thing, even if that's what you needed. Right. And I, I love how he names this autobiographical. That it, it's like you're writing. <laughs> your own narrative here to this conversation right and not even taking to affect their their feelings and what they're actually saying because i know as a teenager similar to what you said as a teenager when my parents would say oh i went through the same thing i'm like you did not go through the same thing (laughs) i mean it may have been similar (laughs) but we really felt as if they had no idea and it's because they followed uh and we all do this uh kind of these four autobiographical steps Mm -hmm. when it comes to um, listening to other people are really wanting to be understood. Right. Not really so what listening. are the four then? Yeah. So we have, um, the first one, which is, uh, evaluate, mm-hmm. which is from the very start of the conversation, you either agree with them or disagree with them, right. which and you verbalize that that's what you're evaluating. Oh yeah, I agree with you or no, I, you know, I wouldn't. Right. And listen to your conversations. If you have conversations with friends and with people at work, Listen to how many of them go, oh, yes, I understand. Now, sometimes we lie. We don't actually understand or uh, disagree with people when we say we do. But um, that's usually where we start off the conversation. And then after Evaluate, we have a probe Mm -hmm. where you just ask objective questions questions mm-hmm. you just probe and probe and like probe well, what would you do that for or you know whatever right yeah something like that and it's it can you know when we're talking about communicating and communicating empathetically it can seem as if right. that's a good thing to do right. sometimes i think those questions are honest questions coming from a good place yeah but also some of them can be kind of negative or derogatory even in nature and i think that's what stephen covey's getting at right and i think that's a good example probing. well why why'd you do that yeah why, why would you do that yeah. or why would you think that you know that's yeah. a good example and then we have advice where you give your advice and that's mm-hmm. where you hear the whole, well, this is what I would do. Yep. Or when I was younger, this is what I did. Or, you know, you'll understand this when you're older kind of thing. And you give that advice. Um, and then the fourth one uh, is pretty much where you, <laughs> it's pretty much where you, I can't remember it. Is the, fir- is the fourth one perspective? No, it's not perspective. It begins with an I. Intrusive? No, no, it's not intrusive. Integ- it's not integrity. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the fourth one. Yeah, but the fourth one, what it was about is is just basically inserting your own your own personal experiences into their yes. into their life, and that's what it basically comes down to. Yes. They're like, oh yeah, because when I did this, this is what happened, so that's what you need to do, that right. kind of thing. We'll find the word when we pull out the yeah. book. Yeah. So that's what the fourth one basically is, right. and uh, and so yeah, all those. 
together, like they come out in conversations with other people that we have all the time yeah. and other people use them on us all the time. Like, right. And uh, it's so common when you think about, you know, conversations that you had, things that you said right. to other people like that stuff comes up. And he Stephen Covey basically says that those things they're not productive right. is basically what it comes down to is that they're not productive in conversation. They're not productive in building relationships. They're not productive in basically just getting to a deeper level of communication and a deeper, uh, you know, connection with that person Yeah, because they hinder people actually letting their guard down and actually saying what's actually on their mind. And that's what he describes through a couple other stories, mostly through, a father and a son communicating yeah. with each other, but it could be through any conversation with any person, you know, a friend or a colleague. And when you when you speak with these autobiographical responses, it basically build it puts up walls, it yeah. builds barriers it, rather than break them down, so that right. you can actually get to a deeper level of authenticity with each yeah. other. And and that's what he 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 shows is that it it's just restrictive, and you can actually get to a more meaningful conversation because most of the time people want to open up and they want to share what's really on their mind and their heart, but they're unwilling to do that because those responses come with some kind of negative feeling or emotion or some kind of derogatory intuition with what you're saying, even right. if that's not what you intend. Right. And that story of the dad and the son, he that's a that's really is a bulk of this chapter is that illustration. But what he does is he moves us from okay, you see this dad using these auto uh, biographical responses, mm -hmm. and so he he does the same list that we just created. You know, he asks those probing questions. You know, he gives his advice, and yeah. layer after layer after layer, the son who comes home and says, "Dad, I don't know if I want to do high school anymore." He pretty much builds layer after layer after layer instead right. of breaking those down. And the conversation moves from logical mm -hmm. to more and more emotional. emotional. Yep. And when we do seek to understand others first, when we really do, do uh, try that, um, and we're going to talk about the ways that he does that, and then he breaks those down in the story of the dad and the son as well, uh, which I thought was super helpful for him to put in parentheses, okay, and right. this is the step that he's doing now. Uh for, for him to do that, um, really, you know, again, those walls were built up and it moved away from logical and uh, the son just got more and more emotional. It, he walked away from the conversation the son did in that first example and absolutely nothing was accomplished. Right, right. And the son got defensive yeah. because of those probing questions, those um, advice that mm -hmm. was given when he wasn't looking for it. Those, that and then kind the of dad even walked away. Yeah. Uh, emotional as well right, and right. hardened by the conversation yep. not because the son's up. not listening he's right. not paying attention you know that kind of thing yeah and uh yeah it's really interesting because he goes through that conversation in the book and he describes kind of the emotion what the son is thinking but he's not saying yeah and that type of thing so you get a you get a sense of what's behind the scenes in right. the sense of each of their brains as they go through this conversation. Then he talks to us about the four stages of communication. And basically what he means is how to actually properly communicate in a way that's effective. Yeah. And these stages, they really are developmental. And so it's one kind of after another, you know, you don't, you don't just do, you don't just set one stage for the whole conversation and that's right. all you do. Um, he starts off with mimicking. Yeah. He uh, And uh, let me just say, he yeah. calls them stages, but I really think like you just, if you stick to stage four, that's really where you need to be in stage four. But he uses stages as like you work up to stage four in your own skill set and yes. ability. Because like he says now, he clarifies skill is not what is needed here really. No. Because when you just use skill, it's tactical and it's not authentic. And people see that as ingenuine right. and uh, or disingenuine, right. and they'll shut down because yeah. people like hate fake. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, they and they do. and they see it a mile away. So it's not something that's skill based, but you need a certain set of skill to 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 get there. Yes. Right. And when he's saying is obviously based on you know this is no surprise, but we need the habits one, two, and three as a form, as a solid foundation yes, for then being authentic and not letting this come across as a skill tactical base, like trying to manipulate or that kind of thing and come off and instead come off as a genuine 
um, attempt to understand the other uh, other individual. Right. So that's where the basis of these four stages come from. The first stage being mimicking, like you yes. said, and again, mimicking is a skill, but it's that it's we have to go beyond just mimicking what the other person said. And, but that's just the first stage. Right. And, and when you do, if, if that's all you tend to do is mimic people, like if you were talking to me, he came up to me and said, hey, Chris, I'm really having trouble understanding this. I said, oh, you're really having trouble understanding this. I mean, that just doesn't sound <laughs> I'm like, that are you just genuine. repeating me? <laughs> yeah, you're just repeating me. And oftentimes when we do mimic people, he says something similar to this in the book uh, that, you know, when we do just mimic people, it, it, it to me almost sounds like we're saying, uh huh, yep. Yep, sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like you do kind of over the phone when you're not really listening, yeah. you're really doing something else. Uh, that's kind of where it gets. So you don't, that's not really an empathetic style of communication mm -hmm. as well. But we are building up to that, uh, including right. this right. second stage. Right. Yeah. And so uh, the second stage then is moving from just mimicking, but to then um, changing what is said and, 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 and adding, basically repeating what is said, but in, in your own words. Right. So you're taking it and, and, and delivering it in, in different words. Right. Different you're really wordage. rephrasing yeah. the content is pretty much what you're, what you're doing. Rephrasing the content. Yeah. yeah. You're not saying it exactly the same, but, uh, and, and that tends to, to the hearer, give right. a little bit more understanding. Like, oh, okay. He kind of, it shows that you're paying attention. Right. You understand what they're talking about. Right. You know, it was like, Hey Chris, I didn't understand this chapter at all. Yeah. And then you respond with, you know, okay, I see you're, um, you know, you, having you, a difficult yeah, time. Yeah, you're having with a this. difficult time understand getting all this, like understanding all this. You know. Right. You say it in different words. You rephrase it. Yeah. And uh, actually, I've thought about that for a few examples too. And I'm like, it's actually when he gives the examples. Oh, you're like, okay, yeah, of course. But actually, when you sit down and I thought of, I thought of the other day, I was having a conversation with someone, and I thought about how I could rephrase it, and I'm like. You actually got to sit and think about it. You do. You do. <laughs> it's actually not as easy as you would think it would be right. just to rephrase what someone's saying. Right. But then when you when you because I even struck I even struggled just then trying to give an example. Right. right? No, really, no. It is really <laughs> difficult. But when you do that, again, you're listening, and that's the hard part about this. Yeah. Is you're listening uh, to respond, and that's not what this mm -hmm. seek first to understand. You know. Right. Is is all about is we listen to listen, not to we listen respond. to understand. Yeah. And so that's the difficult part about mm -hmm. this, where, again, it does take some skill, but right. we don't want to pass off as ungenuine, right. like you said. Because he also mentions at some other point in the chapter, he mentions the different types of listening. One yes. is just complete ignoring, yeah. right? And then another you know, another one is um, selective listening. Yeah. And then another one is um, you know, uh, you know, a, a higher level of listening where you're trying to understand. Then the next one is empathic listening, which is the one that Stephen Covey is pushing us towards, empathic listening, mm -hmm. which involves not just understanding, but feeling the emotion behind what they're saying as well. And um, and that's the difference here. Rephrasing the question helps give you the understanding. And then these next couple stages, as we get into stage three and stage four, help with the emotional side of listening to get to that empathic um, level of listening. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is difficult to even just rephrase the question sometimes because again, you're just you you have to really internalize what they're saying and then be able to repurpose that in in your own words right. to understand. And uh, it's it's actually you know it's actually something again you have to practice. This is why this is why he says there's skill involved. It's not just skill, right. but there is skill involved because you have to practice it. Right. So then the third right, what's the third stage? Is, yes, is reflecting feelings. So mm -hmm. we really move past just mimicking or kind of rephrasing what they say, but we really get into the grit of the emotion because yeah. we have to remember as we seek to understand, mm -hmm. they are, especially at the beginning of what tends to be an emotional conversation, people uh, or, or whoever is speaking to you, they say something, but they really may feel something different or, or very similar to what they're saying, but they don't come right out oftentimes and say exactly, exactly what they're feeling. So we have to reflect those feelings. And as we reflect those feelings correctly back to them, or in a real sense, kind of draw from them what they're trying to say, but they're not really saying, if we say it for them, it kind of gives them an avenue right. to speak the rest of their feelings right. out and to explain a little right. bit further. So then basically what stage four is, is then taking a combination of two and three and bringing it together. And so it's the rephrasing of content and reflecting the feeling, mm -hmm. reflecting the emotion. Mm -hmm. And that is stage four. And 
uh, that's what Stephen Covey wants us to shoot for in communicating, in seeking to understand, right. and properly doing that, rephrasing the content and reflecting the emotion gives way to then people opening up, people uh, talking more, people saying really what's truly on their mind. Right. Right. Yeah, it really opens up the door for you to truly understand them. Because I, I can't remember where I read this before, but it takes about seven minutes in a deep conversation. This was not in the chapter in this in this book, but uh, it takes about seven minutes to really get into a deep conversation with someone. And so the deeper and deeper you can go, really, the more that you um, you know rephrase their content and reflect their feelings. Really, the more you do this, the deeper and the deeper you can go. Um, and not only do we see this and reflect feelings based off of what people are saying, but we also mm -hmm. do it based off of how they look. Right. You know, he gives different percentages mm -hmm. in this chapter uh, for that. And I believe he said about 60% of our communication is body language. It's nonverbal, yeah. It's nonverbal, so it's yeah. not actually what we say. So that's that's another way that we reflect is looking at people mm -hmm. and then being able to tell, okay, w you know, what are they feeling or how can I rephrase this in a way uh, that wouldn't wouldn't lean them towards be becoming more emotional because when they do, you want right. to reflect more feelings, um, but uh, figuring out a logical solution for themselves, which was the beauty behind the dad and the son and him breaking out these stages uh, and him breaking out uh, this communication style because you saw that uh, the son really came up with his own solutions and the dad really didn't have to give that much advice right. until the son asked for it. Asked and for when it. someone gives you permission, that's the important part. That's when you've yeah. really done a good job of uh, reflecting those feelings. Yep, yep, exactly. And that's the thing that stuck out to me at the end of all this. And and he talks about versus the, uh, the logical and the emotional side of a conversation and the side of communication. And basically, you... You in 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 your stage four response in communicating in that way, it opens up to the other person to then be able to respond in in a logical way, mm -hmm. to have a logical response, not in just a purely emotional response. And so when someone responds in a logical response, then you can then give your input and advice if they're asking for it. Right. But then as soon as they turn emotional again, Stephen Covey says, once they turn emotional again, then you have to go back to empathic listening. Okay. Um, because when you, someone is emotional and speaking out of emotion, they're not really open to input, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, he's, and you see that play out in the, uh, in the examples that he gives is that when they turn logical and they're saying, you know, because that example with the son, he's like, you know, hey, what would you do in this situation, dad? And he's like, yeah, I, this is. I think maybe you should look at this. And then his son gives an emotional response. And so then he goes back to listening. And then after he listens some more, the son asks another question. Okay, so then what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And then dad says, okay, well, this is what I think about this. You know, and so they can go on. And so it's very interesting that, that coin of logical versus emotional mm -hmm. and balance and, you know, flipping that coin depending on how you respond. Right. To the other person. Right. And it's strange that that wildly emotional son at the beginning of the conversation seemed to be quite logical at the end, by the mm -hmm. end of the conversation, which we, and that's just what we need. And that's what communication does for all of us is it kind of navigates us through this, these messy waters of, of life. Um, and so it can be a really powerful thing as we saw in that example. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think wrapping up as he moves on mm -hmm. to this thought is, you know, again, he uses the father and son example a lot in this chapter, but again, it can be applied to any relationship, anytime you're communicating, and it's one that's instantly, instantly applicable. And uh, you know, he mentions also some business scenarios as yeah. well, which I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. In how you know, even in a deal where he's talking, you know, this person is laying it all out, and he's trying to pitch them, and they're not really going for it; they're about to lose the deal. He then sits down and just like, okay, let me talk to you. Let me try to explain exactly what you're looking for here and correct me where I'm wrong and where I don't have a correct understanding of what you want here. And he goes through and he explains it all. By the time he's in, he's done relating to these people and explaining to them what they, what they want and really understanding what they want, then they just look at him and say, 
whatever the price, whatever we'll take it. You right, know what I mean? Right. And that's and and boom, they just made a deal when yeah. he's been struggling to make that deal for a long time. Right. That's that's a perfect example of a win win situation arriving yeah. to a win win situation. They felt heard. Mm-hmm. And he was able to uh, understand them on a deeper level. And because of that sentiment towards them, they were like, all right, well, mm-hmm. here, we'll give you this since you right. uh, took the time to understand right. us. So really powerful. Right. Yeah. And so basically this next section and these next few chapters, he talks about the second half of the habit, which is then seeking to be understood. So not only do you have to fully understand, but you got to make sure that they understand you then in turn. It's it's a two two way street. You both have to be on the same page, right? Basically, and when doing that, he talks about basically. Really, he talks about first. It takes courage to do that. When he said in you know, I think the last chapter is that thinking win win both takes compassion and consideration. It takes consideration, but it also takes courage, yeah. right? And that's basically thinking win-win here is that you have to be compassionate and considerate of the other person and what they think and fully step into their shoes and understand where they're coming from. But you also have to be, you have the courage to speak up and say, here's, here's what I think too. You know what I mean? You have to come, you have to bring forth your expectations, your thoughts, your ideas. And he basically equates this kind of almost like a formula and to this Greek phrase, and Chris, right. you've taken Greek. I have. You've taken a few Greek classes. Sh- shameless uh, graduate school plug here. <laughs> I am working on my master's. Will be done in December, and then working on a doctorate. So, Doctor Chris, way to go! It's gonna happen. Me, yeah, yeah. it's gonna happen. It's getting Dr. there. Doctor Chris, it's getting there. So anyway. yeah, so enlighten us, Doctor Chris. I will. What do these three Greek words even mean, and yes. what are they? Yes. Okay. So. Ethos or ethos really is the first word. Everyone pronounces it ethos Mm because it has an O in it, but Mm -hmm. really that uh, sound in the Greek is really more of an ah, kind of like low. A lot of people say logos, which is one of the words as well, but it's really logos. Mm -hmm. People don't know that. Anyway, so ethos um, really... Uh, he he says in this, as we're trying to seek to be understood, not just to understand, but to be understood now, uh, he really breaks this down um, into... Uh, these three different characteristics that these ancient Greeks really had a hold of. And the first one was this word defined as ethos, which is kind of like the uh, personality character or the character of uh, a person understanding their their personality. And so there's three parts to this. There's ethos, then there's pathos, which is really understanding the feeling, the feeling, and then logos, uh, which is really the logic side of it. So you really have to have those three components, uh, but those are the three words, ethos, pathos, and logos. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. see, I know nothing about Greek, so thank you for yes, that. you're welcome. Um, yeah, so he then equates this, he takes this, yeah information and uses it basically as a you know kind of like a theory as a or an ideology on how to approach seeking to be understood right and so he talks about the first one which remind me again the first one ethos Uh uh-huh which then means which is like your personality it's character is another word for that and so he basically equated that as in like you know uh trust in a relationship right and if you've already built trust if you've deposited into that person's emotional bank account You've built trust, right? And so that's the first process. The person has to trust you. They they have to know that you're sincere. They have to um, believe in your authenticity, basically. The second one, pathos. Yep. Which he then feeling. Yeah, basically, and he re, he equates this kind of to you, you, the relationship, mm-hmm. right? And so that's basically, it's similar. It, it goes hand in hand. The relationship, you know, you're putting into their, you're depositing into their emotional bank account that type of thing, and you fully understand where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. You know, you understand their emotion, and you and you um, audibly, uh, you know, translate that. You give them, again, rephrasing the content and, mm-hmm. and reflecting the emotion back to them of what they think and their understanding of the situation. Mm-hmm. That's the second part. Then the third part is then the logic, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And so then that third part is where you actually give your your uh, analytical side of the equation, what you think, the logic behind why you think that way, you know, all that. Right. And basically that's the order that he suggests that you go in because most of the time we skip straight to the logic. Right. Right. We skip straight to the, lo- well, this is the analytical reason. This is why, da, 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 da. Right. but no one cares. 
until you first get until you first get the sincerity, the trust behind it to that in, with that individual, you understand their problem and what they think about it. Mm-hmm. And then you can get to the logic. No one cares about the logic before you get before you tackle those first two things. Right. Especially us guys are so bad about this. Right. Getting straight to the logic, straight to the fixing things. And that's not what this type of communication is about <laughs> whatsoever. It's it's right. not about fixing things. Right. It's it's about getting uh, to the heart and understanding that they under and showing them that you understand that you're in their shoes in their world. You're getting to the heart of the situation and this this uh, problem is bigger than just some quick fix method that we guys always seem right. to want to come up with. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, how many times does someone come at you with the logical straight, you know, with the logic straight off right. the bat? You know what I mean? I'll tell you how to fix that. That's yeah. Fix mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Or whatever. Right. Or this is why this works and that's how you do it. Right. You don't care. You yeah. really don't. It's, they say, it's hilarious. You know, even if it's the right thing, even right. if it's the right thing, you don't care. They say, I disagree with you and here's how we can't agree with one another. So here's how you can fix your opinion on the whole situation. I've heard something similar to that before. Right. Anyway. Right. And it's true when you come first with the, with the, um, with the, with the relationship and then the understanding and the empathy, then you can have a meaningful conversation about the logistics basically is what he's saying in this section. So basically in wrapping all this up and coming to a conclusion with this chapter, I think it's really interesting, you know, this is kind of the steps to 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 thinking win win. This is again like another addition into thinking win win. You have right. to first understand and then you can be understood. Mm-hmm. And that's the first process. That's the first step into thinking win win. Mm-hmm. And it's just another thing that builds upon the other as far as interpersonal uh interdependence, you know, relations and 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 all of that. Um and uh again a really powerful uh, habit to uh, to learn and apply. Yeah, there sure are. Yeah, there are a lot of quotes that I have highlighted and underlined yeah. in this chapter. So are you ready to open up the book and yeah. see what we got? Let's pull it out. All right. All right. So Chris, during our intermission, I picked up a LaCroix because I finished my coffee. So oh, I needed some LaCroix. Longer the coffee. I'm going with the lime. Right. Lime LaCroix. Also, we talked about uh, we just realized that you haven't eaten at all today. I have not eaten and at all is, today. It's like four o'clock. Yeah, it's yep, uh huh, yep. It's so, about uh, that. My watch didn't turn on when I flipped it up, so that's kind of embarrassing. But other than that, <laughs> yes, I haven't eaten all day, so I'm gonna be eating after this. So Chris, yeah, you need you need something. You need I do. something to to energize yourself. Here. Yes, I do. So we'll we'll try and push through the rest of this podcast here. We'll uh, um, we'll get it done. We'll make it. Yeah. You'll, you'll make it. Well. Thank you. Yeah. With your help, I will. All right. Okay. <laughs> so we have uh, the books out, and we're just going to go through, touch on some things that we think we need to um, um, talk about a little bit more, things that we might have missed in recapping it. Also, just pick out some favorite highlights, some favorite quotes that we that we enjoyed from, mm-hmm. the, from the chapter. So I want to start out with this, uh, this, this one right here, where basically he's talking about character and communication. Reading and writing are both forms of communication, so are speaking and listening. And he talks about the ability to do those four things well is absolutely critical to your effectiveness. And he also says that communication is the most important skill in life. Yeah. And I think we forget about that because we just do it so much. We talk all the time. We, you know, we read all the time. We write all the time. You know, but it really is the most important skill that we can possess in life. Good communication skills. Right. Right. And, uh, and again, he talks about that skill is not the end all be all in, you know, in something in, in being effective, Mm -hmm. you know, just having skill, but it's, you know, very important in the ingredients that you need to be effective. Right. Right. Yeah. He, he says that, uh, and this applies right back to the leadership that we touched on a couple chapters ago, leadership versus managing. But he says the the real key to your influence, which is really what all leadership is, is influence with me is your example, your actual conduct. So not only do we communicate with words, but with our conduct mm-hmm. as well, which flows naturally out of your character, right. out of the person that you truly are. Right. So right. even if the you know, even if someone gave good advice, you wouldn't listen to them if they were a murderer. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, so it's, it's, your conduct matters, your character matters in being effective in communicating and being effective in, in really uh, having an influence on people. Right. In a positive way. 
Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely true that depending on how someone conducts themselves depends on how you treat their advice and their words and what they say. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and basically, you know, he talks about also interacting effectively to influence someone. You have to first understand me. You're not going to influence anyone that you don't fully understand. Right. And they won't and they won't uh, accept your you know intentions of influence or your you know your attempts at influence if you don't understand them first and you can't do that with technique alone as we mentioned before right so moving on here um you know obviously most people do not listen with the intent to understand they listen with the intent to reply mm -hmm. you know you're listening or you're either speaking or you're or you're ready or you're preparing to re respond. Mm -hmm. You're either speaking or preparing to speak. You know, most of the time that's what we do. Right. You know what I mean? And and uh, and it's it's true for a lot of us all the time. And and I think again with this example of him talking with his son or talking with um, you know, anyone really is that you know, these people don't have, usually we don't have, including us, we don't have the vaguest idea of what's really going on in some inside someone's head. And, uh, you know, you just see someone and you think you have similar experiences, then, then you automatically know what they're thinking and what's going on. But right. you really don't. Even if you have similar experiences, even if like, you know, a father, son, oh, I know what it's like growing up being a teenager. You, you did, but it's still not the same. Right. Yeah. Really what we want to do is we want to be able to listen and listen in a fashion where we get inside the other person's frame of reference, as he calls it here. And I love how he says empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy is a form of agreement, mm -hmm. a form of judgment, whether you think they're right or wrong. But really what we want to get to is empathy, not uh, sympathy. And that's the kind of right. listening we want to do. It's more right. registering, it's more reflecting. Um, and it's more than just the words that are said. It's our conduct as well as we just right. touched on. It's getting inside someone's frame of reference. It's yeah. seeing the world as they see it. And that's why tools like the Enneagram and like Myers-Briggs and all, and those type of things, um, get, are, are really popular and very popular among, you know, in, in a business setting, in an organization setting, right. or even in a personal setting, it helps you see people from their perspective. Right. And, uh, yeah, really quick, I wanted to also list the, uh, what he calls the four levels of listening. Yes. The first one is ignoring, which is just not really listening at all. The second one is pretending, which is the, yeah, uh huh. Mm -hmm, yeah. But you're just letting it f go in one ear and right at the other. Selective listening is only hearing certain parts of the conversation. And then, uh, the last one is attentive listening, which is paying attention and using focused energy on the words that are being said. Um, but he then adds his own fifth level of listening, which is the empathic listening. And that's what he spends the rest of the chapter talking about how we reach empathic listening and how we do that effectively. And I like this kind of analogy that he uses here. And I we didn't mention this at the beginning, but I wanted to touch on this here because this is one of the things that stuck out to me actually the most mm -hmm. in this chapter. Ironically, I didn't remember it, but it stuck out to me the most while I was reading it. Uh -huh. So he talks about, you know, you're obviously in with, you know, listening empathically. You're actually making deposits into that person's emotional bank account. Um, and because, you know, you're doing that, basically what you do, he calls it this term of giving the person psychological air, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because you understand like when when you need oxygen, right? You have a need for oxygen. We all need oxygen. But when was the last time you actually thought about how much you need oxygen or when did that occupy your mind? Mm -hmm. Never, yeah. unless you were without oxygen and right. then you needed it badly. And he talks about that. This is one of the greatest insights in the field of human motivation. Satisfied needs don't motivate. Mm -hmm. It's only the unsatisfied need that motivates, right? And so when you listen with empathy to another person, you give that person what he calls psychological air, and after that vital need is met, you can then focus on influencing or problem solving. Right. And so I just thought that was a very interesting, um, you know, uh, thought about giving the person psychological air, and that makes sense. Like that's what everyone needs. Everyone wants and needs to be understood. I think I've heard other people say that, you know, you know, we have our physical needs like food, water, shelter. Then the next second most important need is like the need to be understood and need to be 
loved. Right. You know what I mean? Those are the those are the, those. That's what's immediately next, right after food and shelter. Right. Well, he says later in that same section that next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival. In other words, to be understood, he says, to be affirmed, to be validated, right. uh, and to be appreciated. So that is next to human physical right. survival right. is really that, and that is really incorporated. And in if you our, give that, yeah, yeah, if you give that to that to that person, the person you're speaking to, then that's what opens up for you to actually be able to influence them in a positive way. Right. And again, not to influence them, to manipulate them, just to be a helpful person or, you know, just to actually communicate with them and get to a deeper level of relationship with them. Right. Which really, that's what lends us to diagnosing before prescribing, mm-hmm. as you mentioned in the first section, really. And he says, and he says this plain out, he says, seeking first to understand, in other words, diagnosing before you prescribe is hard. That's literally the yeah. sentence I just read to you. He says that it's very difficult yeah. to do. Yeah, yep, exactly. So then also another quote here that I kind of like stuck out to me. Um, he's talking about when he goes through like, I think mostly like business you know, a business proposal is kind of like the example that he has here. But really, again, this is anything. When it comes down to it, he says, other things being relatively equal, the human dynamic is more important than the tech technical dimensions of a deal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I find that interesting. Again, like if someone, you know, want to do business with someone and you're trying to, um, trying to come up with a solution, trying to come up with a deal that you can make with this person, the a human level, the human element of that situation is actually more important than the technical aspects of what even the deal is about you know and i think that's interesting because we don't think about that we think what is the technical what are the things i can sweeten the deal with what can i say that will make him think this thing is really important that he needs to have it none of that matters as much as just really connecting on a human level and when you connect on a human level a lot of those things really just take care of themselves or they don't even matter as much right yeah, and I love how in this how he kind of organizes this chapter because when it comes to connecting on that level that you were just speaking to, he starts off with the ways that we do it in a more natural sense that don't really work, which we said was the four autobiographical responses, which I feel as if we went over pretty well. Right. Uh, the word, so it's evaluate, probe, uh, advice, and then interpret, interpret is that last one, which is explain their motives, which I told to you before That's the we one even we started. Yeah. Yeah, that before we even started recording, I thought I told you I said I think that's really funny that we try to explain the motives of other people. Right. We're not even taking the time to understand. Right. Really ironic to me, but those are the four autobiographical responses. So he starts this chapter off by telling us, okay, this is what we do, and this is how it's not working, and then we got into the four stages in which it does work. Yeah, exactly. So those are the four autobiographical responses. Then the four steps to empathic listening basically here the four steps to empathic listening is one uh, mimicking the content Mm -hmm. right and we said that's he says that's the least effective yeah and it's a first stage skill because it it's just it it's not really productive but it's the basis for the rest of this the rest of these stages right second stage rephrase the content Right. Again, just giving it in another in another uh, wording, your wording, you know, um, switching around so that you fully understand. And you can then you can then say those things back to that person in a way that acknowledges that you understand and you're, mm-hmm. you you fully you fully um, grasp yes. what the person is saying. Right. And then third, reflect the feeling. And then fourth is then rephrasing the content and reflecting the feeling all at the same time. Right. And uh, you're, and he says here the 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 key about the the important thing about stage four is that you're using both sides of your brain to understand both sides of the communication. Mm-hmm. So it's left and right brain mm-hmm. at the same time, and that's what's important about that. And he says as you authentically seek to understand, as you rephrase the content and reflect feeling, you give uh, that person psychological air, and you also help him work through his own thoughts and feelings. So it actually helps people fully you know realize and understand and then and then put into words their own thoughts and feelings right because sometimes we have a hard time audibly describing and authenticating our own thoughts and feelings sometimes you know we have thoughts and we have feelings but getting those out on paper is a tough thing to do and so someone who is actually at this fourth stage of you know empathically listening to someone helps them actually get to that conclusion Right. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what this father son scenario that we already spoke of uh, played out so well. What, what worked out with the father as he moved in this uh, story 
uh, for him to uh, go down these four different stages and really stick to that fourth stage. Really what happened was he became more and more sensitive to the son's communication. Mm -hmm. And he, he writes here towards the end of that story, as long as the response is logical... Uh, the father can effectively ask questions to give counsel. So as you hear people in the conversation and their communication become more logical, less emotional, then that's when you can begin to, you know, help them understand you. That's when really that understood part comes into play. Yep. But the moment the response becomes emotional, the dad needed to go back to this right. empathetic, this empathic right. listening, uh, right. where he did again uh, rephrase some of the responses. Um, and reflect the feelings as right. well. He returned back to that, and that worked out well. Right, and and he says doing that correctly, the father in this example just turned a transactional opportunity yeah, into a transformational into I a transformational yep. transformational opportunity. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, you know it really speaks to the power that communicating in this way has. Right. You know, it has a lot of potential um, in it. Right. Yeah. So moving on into these next couple sections here. Um, I think seeking to be understood, he talks about again the the three Greek words that the how do I say that ethos <laughs> ethos pathos and logos yes um, which he says uh, again as we kind of mentioned that the early Greeks had a magnificent philosophy this is really just a philosophy uh, that embodied three sequential uh, arranged words right uh, and those words kind of help guide us right uh, to uh, help seek uh, and understand right. people first and I think. He gives basically an example of these three things in action, what these look like realistically, yeah. you know, and basically he's talking about this example that he had with a, uh, you know, a friend. Uh, he's working on, uh, you know, pitching these people and he's like, I'm trying to make this deal. I'm pitching these people. All right. He's like, well, I know you're sincere and the and, uh, you know, the research that you that you want to do will be good. Right. That's like the first step. Mm -hmm. Right. And um and then also the second step would be then describing the alternative they are in favor of better than they can themselves. So describing what they want better than they can even do it. That's right. the goal, the second step. And then the third then carefully explain the logic behind yours, right, your idea. And so doing those three, one, he already he's built trust with these people already. So that's the first step. The second, then un, uh, understanding and resp and repeating what they want back to them better than they can. Yeah. And then giving his logical uh, ideas and thoughts behind that situation right. and so those were the basically those three steps kind of actualized right um, in this example right um, you know habit five lifts you to greater accuracy greater integrity in your presentations and people know that basically is right. that you just become more real in dealing with in dealing with people right and the other powerful thing about Habit 5 is it's right in the middle of our circle of influence. And right. this is where he gets into a one-on-one -on -one section where he says, you can always first seek to understand. And this is why this habit is uh, one of the habits, uh, one of the first habits we see that we can really begin immediately. There's right. not much thought or process behind it. I mean, we can, we can start uh, right after kind of understanding and digesting this. Right. chapter. Um, and he says, that's something within your control. And as you do that, as you focus on your circle of influence, you really deeply understand other right. people. It's right in the middle of our circle of influence. Right. And so it's actionable always right now. Right. And so the more deeply that we understand other people, he also writes in this one-on-one -on -one section, he says, the more you will appreciate them, the more reverent you will feel about them. Uh, to touch the soul of another being uh, is to walk on holy ground. So again, some more magnificent writing of Stephen Covey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And basically it comes down to making the human element as important as the financial or the technical element. That's right. And again, it's just being more human. Right. You know, it's kind of just a step by step guide on how to be more human with other people, how right. to be just more real. You know what I mean? And I think that's a word that's thrown around a lot in our society of being, oh, just being real and authentic or whatever. And some of that even is kind of tactical and, and, um, you know, kind of like gimmicky in a sense, I think some of it. But this is really here, this is the steps to being more real. Right. You know what I mean? This is true authenticity here. Right. Yeah, I love how he kind of comes um, to a close on this. It's not the last sentence, but he says, when you listen, you learn. 
Yeah. Uh, and you also give the people who work for you and with you psychological air. Again, he he draw. I'm glad that you mentioned that psychological air at the beginning because he traces that all the way through here to the end because of how important uh, this is. And when you give psychological uh, air to people, that's again where these conversations become transformational, right? Instead of just transactional. Yep. Yep. And to wrap up the chapter here. He says, when we really deeply understand each other, we open the door to creative solutions and third alternatives. Our differences are no longer stumbling blocks to communication and progress. Instead, they become the stepping stones to synergy. Right. And synergy is kind of, he leaves you on a cliffhanger. He does, because you're like, what's synergy? Right. And then you turn to Habit 6, and it's synergized Synergized. right there. Yep. So that is Habit 6. So basically... Habit five leads to habit six, of course, just building on top of each other as we go through. Um, but, you know, backing up a little bit, our differences are no longer stumbling blocks to communication and progress. Mm-hmm. Right. How how important is that? How powerful is that? You know what I mean? Because we think about differences and we think about walls like stumbling blocks, roadblocks like, right. you know what I mean? <laughs> Not having common ground. We're like, oh, it throws a wrench in everything. Right. But that's not what he's saying. Actually, when you when you seek first to understand, then to be understood, it takes away those roadblocks and it actually paves the way for a better, clearer road. Right. And what it leads to is they become stepping stones. He ends with synergy. So yep. we have to look at habit six, which we're going to break down and read and discuss. Right. Synergize. Synergize. Which actually kind of side note, this is the first one where... Synergize is the first one where I read that word and I'm not 100% sure what he means right off the bat. You know, the other ones are kind of almost self-explanatory. I mean, of course, I say self-explanatory when he has like an hour and a half of of reading material, you know, on on that one habit. But but synergize, it's not immediately clear as to what is the idea behind behind it. So I'm interested. I am ready to dive into that chapter and uh, and fully understand what he means by that. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, um, that'll be next week. So next podcast episode. Yep. Looking forward to it. All right.